Hi, I'm David Akimi with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services. Today I'm going to discuss the five major components that go into every modern tracked home roof. We're going to break it down into drip edge, ice and water shield, underlayment, shingles, and venting. These are the five main things every roof will be composed of. We're going to head back to the studio with my roofer, Dennis Miller of Best Roof Roofing, and he's going to break down these components one by one and show you what to look for to know whether your roofer is installing a quality roof on the new home you're building. All right, Dennis, the first major component, as you've told me, on any roof here in Colorado is the drip edge. I'm going to let you go to town and tell us a little bit more about what you know on drip edges. All right, so with drip edge, there's typically just different lengths. Uh, drip edge is the very first component that goes at the end of the shingle down into the gutter, so that way when you have moisture coming down, it helps it go right in the gutter. So typically with most common new builds, you find a basic two by two. It can either be painted or it can be galvanized. So typically most builders are going to use galvanized just typically because of cost. This goes on first, they paint it afterwards so that way you don't see that it's bright and shiny. And then you also have the other which is 2x4. So you can get either galvanized or powder coated in 2x2 or 2x4. There are some other lengths but those are going to be the two major that we use. So Dennis, you said before when we were talking that there's not a real quality difference between the galvanized and the painted. It's mostly for cosmetic purposes just so you don't see a shiny edge? Correct. Yep. Okay. So obviously with the eaves, you're going to see the gutters there. So you're not going to be able to see if it's galvanized or painted in most okay. cases, but on the rakes, you get to see if it's galvanized and if it's just galvanized, it sticks out like a sore thumb. It's going to be shiny. Got it. And so the main quality difference is not necessarily between the galvanized or the painted, but the length of it. You said it either comes four inches or two inches and you're essentially referring to how far up the roof it runs. That is correct. So okay. it's going to be two inches down into the gutter regardless. And then it's either going to go back under two inches or four inches. Okay, so the second component we encounter on roofs in Colorado is going to be called ice and water shield. And I'll let Dennis go into detail on what ice and water shield is. So ice and water shield is this barrier here pictured in the picture. It goes up from the drip edge and it's at the eaves and then in the valleys. And what ice and water shield is, I like to compare it to grip tape on a skateboard. It's got a peel and stick backing to it. You peel it off, it sticks directly to the wood decking. The idea is that if you get moisture that comes up out of the gutter or moisture running down the shingle, there's no way for it to penetrate this and get to the wood decking because it's sticking directly to the wood. So we find this at the eaves. Typically it's gonna be 24 inches into the heated structure of the home and then in any valleys. Got it. And you were telling me before that uh, you usually find this used most commonly in cold areas, high elevation, and then maybe some places that are prone to hurricanes. Is that correct? That is correct. And you said the cold areas are because essentially in Colorado, as snow starts to melt off a roof, it congregates on that last two or three feet as it melts off. And that's typically where it sits the longest. It is. And typically we can have freeze thaw here in Colorado, meaning the moisture is melting, going into the gutter. Then at night it refreezes. It can actually start working its way back up underneath the shingle. And because it's stuck directly to the wood decking, there's no way for the wood to be hit with moisture. Got it. And you said that when that happens, if you're talking about a roof that does not have that ice and water shield, when that freeze thaw cycle starts to work its way back up the roof, it can potentially dry rot the uh, the roof decking. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it can. Got it. So the the addition of uh, this extra layer protects against that. And were you also saying that not all builders use it? Is that a safe? Not all builders use it. Okay. Most builders will go by specifically what code states. So in certain cities, if ice and water shields are not required, it may only be in the valleys because valleys are high traffic areas for moisture. Got it. So if they don't use it, they're going to use just a cheap underlayment all the way down to the drip edge instead of that extra beefy piece that's got adhesive on the end exactly. of it. Exactly. Got it. So that would be the mark of a high quality builder roof or one of the marks of a high quality builder roof if we see them spending the extra money to put the ice and water around the perimeter of the, of the edges if it's not code in that municipality. So yeah. obviously if it's code in the municipality, it's to. going to have it, but in the areas to where it's not required, if the builder is then using it, because it's a cheap insurance policy, you know that you're getting a better builder.
So the third factor we look at when we're determining the quality of the roof is the underlayment. And the underlayment is essentially the layer that goes uh, on top of the wooden decking and between the shingles and the decking, correct? Correct. So in this diagram here, it shows ice and water shield at the eaves. And then you can see that they're running a layer of synthetic felt. And then that will go up to cover the entire rest of the roof and decking. Got it. And you said uh, synthetic felt, but you were telling me earlier, synthetic felt's kind of out of vogue. It's uh, It's been phased out by the synthetic material. Oh, sorry, the, old, the traditional felt has been phased out in favor of the synthetic felt, is that correct? Correct, so traditional felt is gonna be like tar paper. So this is traditional felt here. You can take it, you can just rip it. Yeah. So this is an older school technology. Very few builders are still using this. Almost every person, every builder has gone to synthetic. So if you have a builder that's still using tar paper that's a 100 year old technology, unfortunately, the builder is just doing everything they can to cut corners. Probably not good. And you've got a piece of the synthetic. Here I do have a example. piece of the synthetic felt as well. And this comes in different grades. This is the standard 20 pound felt. And as you can see, it's very thin. It's synthetic. The greatest thing about this is you can't rip it. So as hard as I try to tear this, it will not rip. It has to be cut with a blade. Got it. So that's a super robust material. But you were telling me as strong as this is, it actually still comes in four different uh, pound ratings, is that correct? It does. So you can get 15 pound, 20 pound, 25 pound, and 30 pound. Typically, as you start moving up in the poundage, it gets a little bit thicker. So depending on the pitch of the roof. So if we have a pitch roof like a 10-12 or a 12-12, a 12-12 is a 90 degree angle. Steep, we'll use, but essentially it, steep. It's a steep roof. A steep roof. Okay. So that's where we would use, a, say, a 30 pound felt. Okay. So that way, when the guys are installing the roof, we run into a situation where they're not potentially ripping that felt. Tearing it as they walk around. Exactly. It. Got it. So it's not necessarily that it's required for a more robust roof. I would assume that it does make the roof more robust at the same time, but you're saying it's mostly to keep it intact while they work on the roof. Correct. So the fourth component of every roof we're gonna look at when we determine quality of a roof are the shingles. So what we see here in this diagram is an architectural shingle, uh, also known as a dimensional. Typically, we're gonna have a standard shingle. So standard shingle here, this is a cutout. You can see that it looks pretty basic. So with this, typically you have 115 mile an hour wind rating. There's really not a whole lot to it. When we move up, we can move into either a class three shingle or a mid-grade shingle. With this particular manufacturer here, you can see that they have a carbon fiber weave in the back of it. What that does is it gives it an additional wind rating. So we go from 115 to 130 mile an hour wind. And then the next is going to be a class four style shingle. When you look at the standard class three, class four, they all look identical. Just as with the class three, it's got the carbon fiber strip, so that way it helps with the additional wind rating. But the difference with this shingle here is it's way more pliable. It actually has a layer of rubber built into the shingle. So this is a great example of the shingle. So what this is, is this is SBS rubber. So as you can see, it keeps coming back to the original shape that it was in. So that's going to be between the underlayment and the granules, essentially. It's actually made into the shingle. Made into the shingle. It's made into the shingle. So by having this in there, the shingle itself is completely more pliable, allowing you to almost roll the shingle up like a piece of newspaper. And then the idea is that if you have a hailstone up to a golf ball size or two inch hail, it's made to bounce off that shingle rather than damaging the shingle. Got it. So that class four can take a golf ball size hill impact without, hopefully without any real damage. Correct. In addition to being wind rated higher. And you said the difference in the wind rating was what, 115 miles? 115 to 130. Some manufacturers say 140 or 150, but typically the stances are 112, or excuse me, 115 to 130. Got it. And I can tell you as a realtor, one of the things I see on the class four roofs is you definitely qualify for a pretty su substantial discount on your monthly homeowner's insurance. You're Usually it's anywhere from 100 to 115 bucks a month. At least that's where it was when I was calling around getting quotes. We bought a house about a year ago and that was what they quoted me. I mean, you, you may know that. You deal with the insurance guys better. Give me your opinion on it. So every insurance company is different. Some insurance companies, it'll be $50 a year. Some of them will be 25% of the annual premium. So you really just have to look and see what your particular insurance company is offering. Some insurance companies don't offer any type of discount for a class four impact resistant. But another key thing to think about is, you know, is it gonna save me from needing to replace my roof sure. again in the future? And having to pay another deductible. Exactly. I mean, when I did mine, I remember it was about a hundred bucks a month and I just 
facepalm myself because I thought, wow, that was less than the difference between the class three and the class four. I would have saved it back with one year of uh, policy discount. And of course I had the roof for many years after that. So I think in most cases, uh, especially on a replacement, it probably makes sense for a lot of people to upgrade. So in addition to the more common asphalt shingles that come in standard or class three and class four, every once in a while we'll encounter tile shingles. Can you give us some insight on tile? Certainly, so a tile roof is known as a 50 year roof, one of the strongest roofs in the industry because it is concrete. So you have styles like this here that's gonna be a flat tile. Uh, you can have S tiles, you can have shake looking concrete tiles, but for the most part, they're all gonna look like this. And the great thing about them is even though they're designed to last 50 plus years, unfortunately, the underlayment that's underneath them, whether it be felt or whether it be a full ice and water shield, typically isn't going to last 50 years. So we might get 25, 30 years, but at some point that's gonna start breaking down and will have to be replaced. Got it, perfect. And you were saying there are some advantages if you have to replace or repair uh, tile versus asphalt. Tell us a little bit about the advantages there. So each one of these tiles are individual. So for that reason, what we can do is if we have one that's broken, we can just take that tile up and put a new one in its place. With no damage to the underlayment. With no damage to the underlayment. The way that the tile sits is it sits on a batten system to where it's actually elevated up off the deck above the and the underlayment so by comparison on an asphalt shingle if you've got to dig one of those out to replace it you've got damage to the underlayment you do so if you have to take out a shingle well there's nails holding that shingle down so if you have to pop those nails out well now you have holes in the underlayment and you got to loosen some of the shingles around it so then when you go and put the new shingle in those nails aren't going to go back in the same spot so you now effectively have holes in your underlayment so and water does run underneath the underneath the shingle because the underlayment and ice and water shield are specifically what's designed to keep your house dry So the fifth component we look at when we're talking about quality on tracked home roofs is the ventilation system. And for all intent and purpose, there are two major styles that are being used today on tracked homes. I'll let Dennis tell us about them. All right, so the first one is gonna be our traditional turtle vent. So uh, it's also called a box vent, called a 750 vent. So this vent here is specifically designed to allow the house to breathe. So this is an exhaust vent. Now the problem is here that this circumference is only 10 inches around. So what you would find on older builds, when the code was less strict, the code was 1300, meaning for every 300 square feet of interior square footage, say if you have a two story home and it's 900 square feet on the second floor, you would need to have three of these vents. Okay. The code is now changed to where it's 1150. So now you need to have six of these vents in lieu of having just three because they're asking for more ventilation. Got it. And these are kind of ugly and bulky and they don't they hold up that well. So they've introduced a new technology, is it? The new one is ridge vent. So okay. the ridge vent here at the ridge and then here's a, a, a piece of the ridge vent. So the difference here is that it sits right at the top of the ridge. So if you keep in mind that heat rises and where is it going to raise the most? To the very tip top. top. The so this here, it's all the way at the top and then Typically you have a four inch cut. So you have two inches on one side and two inches on the other side. And then these typically run 20 plus feet, depending okay. on the length of the ridge. Perfect. And you know, give us a little background education. I know as an agent, one of the things I hear roofers, you primarily tell me is that uh, if the ventilation is insufficient because we've got such intense ultraviolet rays coming down here in Colorado, it heats the roof up too much. And when the roof gets too hot, it causes premature granule loss, is that safe? You can get blistering on the roof, premature granular loss because they're, the roof or the attic space is not breathing. Got it, so all this venting is crucial to keep the air moving and keep the roof cool and to prolong the life of the roofing material. Is that a safe assumption? It depends on the time of the year. So definitely in the summertime, we're trying to keep the attic space cool, which is gonna keep the shingles cool. But in the winter time, we wanna keep that air moving throughout the attic space so that way you're not building up moisture, potentially getting mold. Got it. Perfect, so they serve two purposes. Most certainly. Awesome, well hey, I appreciate you coming here to help us explain all this stuff today. Thanks again.